Um, and tonight we're honored to have with us uh, Paul Goldberger and Mark Lamster, two writers who are engaged with architecture, criticism, and uh, biography. Um, they will speak about Mark's uh, new book on Philip Johnson and the process, uh, what well, we hope also the process of writing biographies about architects. Um, and then in the interest of time, I'll, I'll, I'll keep it brief. Um, Paul Goldberger is a contributing editor at Vanity Fair um, and spent 15 years as the architecture critic for The New Yorker and began uh, his career at The New York Times where he was awarded the Pulitzer Prize for Distinguished Criticism. He is the author of many books, most recently, Building Art, The Life and Work of Frank Gehry, and is also the chairman of the Glass House's Advisory Council, um, as well as the Joseph Urban Professor of Design and Architecture at the New School. Mark Lamster is the architecture critic of the Dallas Morning News, a professor in the architecture school at the University of Texas at Arlington, and a formal Loeb Fellow at uh, the Harvard Graduate School of Design. He is the author of several books, and his uh, writing appears regularly in national magazines and newspapers. For more than a decade, he was a senior editor at Princeton Architectural Press, where he developed a list of well-regarded titles in the fields of architecture and design. Please join me in welcoming Mark and Paul. Uh, well, while he gets turned on, that sounded inappropriate. Uh, while Paul gets turned on, exactly. Uh, I, I just, I'm always turned on. What do you mean? Oh, way too much information. Um, <laughs> uh, I just would thank you all for coming out, and uh, thanks to the Glass House uh, for inviting me out. Uh, I know it's uncomfortable. Uh, perhaps to have uh, a biographer of Philip Johnson uh, talk about Philip Johnson because uh, let's be obviously the history is uh, there's some checkered history um, and a difficult challenging person um, but uh, I think uh, he lived for controversy uh, and loved conversation so to me uh, it was very important that uh, Part of the legacy of the house is having those kind of difficult conversations and enjoying them. So hopefully we can do that. Great, thank you. Also, don't shoot me. <laughs> yeah, part of the legacy of the glass house is not shooting people, but uh, having it's, it's super. Um, we will get back to some of those controversies in a moment or two. Um, let me, since it, one certainly in New Canaan of all places do not does not have to ask the question of why Philip Johnson. Um, I will ask the question, why Philip Johnson now? What is the, uh, it, we're about 13, a little more, 14 years since his death. Um, not quite a full generation of reevaluation, but on the other hand, not uh, the immediate past either as he recedes. What makes this the right moment to produce a book like this? Well, I think it's actually the perfect moment, but the truth is that I started writing it 10 years ago. Okay. Uh, and that was the perfect I, moment. I thought it was right, the right. perfect moment then. Right, okay. Uh, like I, I like to say, that, you know, um, it wasn't really my idea to write a, a book about Philip Johnson. I've told this story, but um, you know, I w was in my agent's office and uh, suggested that you, know, you should write a book about Philip Johnson, and I was like, absolutely not. Um, because I knew Philip Johnson's history, I knew the contours of, of the work. At that point, the Franz Schultz biography had already appeared, right? The Franz Schultz biography was already two decades old okay, at that point. Right, right, right. right? So if the, there's a previous Johnson biography, which, by the way, Philip Johnson hated um, uh, really beyond measure. Um, uh, but that was already several decades old. Although he cooperated with it. Yes, yeah. he did, but he was not happy with it even, right. even still. And in fact, uh, so the deal with the previous biography was that it was going to be posthumous, except, as you know, Johnson had uh, this habit of living for an incredibly long time. Uh, and so the book was written substantially in the 80s, 
uh, uh, but it was going to be published. Agre the agreement was it would be published posthumously, uh, and then Johnson didn't die. Um, and he started feeling guilty that, that about letting this thing, so he allowed it to be published, and then he was like mortified at what he had agreed to. Um, because he had not, if I recall correctly, uh, since he had granted editorial freedom to the writer, he had not actually read the manuscript. Correct. And I, I, I don't want to get into a long discussion about why he, he generally just didn't think that, his pre, that Schultz, his previous biographer, liked him or really felt, understood his work. He thought it was homophobic, which I don't necessarily agree, but um, for a variety of reasons, he felt like I think he didn't see himself in the book. The previous biographer had uh, done a, a Mies uh, biography that was pretty well received. It was sort of very standard architectural historian's uh, biography written by a, an, a serious German-born architectural historian. And you know, Johnson, had this relationship with Mies that was very much uh, an acolyte. Uh, so Mies had this guy write his biography. It made sense that Johnson would have him, right. have him right. do the same thing. Um, and he thought it would be just like, I think, a, you know, a, 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 perhaps not hagiographic, but sort of a boring architectural historian's biography. And it, uh, he was unhappy with it for, in some reasons for that very reason. Um, Boy, I'm digressing. No, no, um, I think it's very, but I think it, it gets to a very important point, and then we'll be done with Franz Schultz and on no, to but, you. Um, but so yeah. the, essentially the point was yeah. the book was out of date when it was published in like 1992, four, whatever it was. Early right? 90s, yeah. In early 90s. So by, I mean, I think 25 years later, and it, and it was published before his death, there was still a substantial number of projects uh, coming out of Johnson's And more years of life. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So there had never been a posthumous biography of Johnson before. And also, the way we think about architecture now had changed dramatically right. uh, since then. There was no Bill Bow like, at that time, for example, um, for better and worse. Um, so it, it was just a, a, a good moment to reevaluate um, what Johnson meant to architecture, what he meant to architecture culture. Uh, you know, one of his last. Uh, principal um, uh, clients was Donald Trump. Uh, that's sort of, uh, and that relationship I think is very telling about uh, a lot of different things. Um, we can perhaps get to that. We will. We will. Um, we will. But, um, it, so, yeah. but it certainly made it current, right? And but I, I, so I thought there was definitely a reason to to be writing this book. And for me personally, I don't, it's interesting like why as a, you choose a subject that you choose. And for me, I didn't want to just write a biography that I wanted something. I, the book that sort of made me want to be a writer about architecture was The Power Broker, right? So that's nominally a biography, you know, uh, Robert Caro's masterpiece uh, uh, of a biography of uh, Robert Moses. It's, it's nominally a biography of Robert Moses, but it's, it's so much more, right? It's like the story of New York in the 20th century, and it's also a, really a story about power and the abuse of power. And I thought with Johnson you had a similar subject, so that you weren't just writing a biography of this one person, although you have this incredibly charismatic, fantastically controversial, fascinating person at, the, at its core, but it, because he lived so long and because uh, of the complexities of his life, that you could write about the history of the American city and the story of architecture over this long period. Um, and the, so to me, there was a, a way to have a book that was much more than just about a person, but to write something truly grand and, and sort of epic, epic um, uh, with grand scope. Um, so whether that achieve that or not is, a, I guess, an open question. Well, but that was the, the reason. Compared to Caro, this is quite concise, actually. And, and you wrote it very quickly. So I yeah, know, yeah. Like, know. Caro's now on like his fourth biography of a uh, Fourth volume of, fourth of, of Johnson, of, yeah. Of, yeah. The, uh, of, 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 of Lyndon Johnson. Yes. LBJ. Well, that's the other thing you guys have in common, I guess. You both are biographers of Johnson. Yes. <laughs> and we have Texas. Uh, but I am not going to get stuck doing another Johnson biographer that takes 40 years. Right, done. So, not a, very chosen. Okay. Um, 
but you know Johnson's, um, you know, the to to go back just one moment again to the Fanshawe's biography, and then we really will be over it. Uh, my understanding was that what really upset Johnson most was not the sort of intimate personal details in that, not the discussion about his um, horrendous politics in the 1920s and 30s, which we'll come back to via your book in a moment, uh, but the fact that Schultz, in the end of the day, didn't think he was a terribly good architect, um, that he was okay, but not really so wonderful, and that Johnson had more or less convinced himself that that was not true, and that he was, in fact, uh, a great architect and could not abide this the relative indifference there. Um, do you think that's true or fair or right? Well, that preys into, yeah. Well, I think he didn't think that, he got the feeling that, that Schultz didn't like him as a person right, right. or as an architect. Mm -hmm. And I think he felt that Johnson didn't, that uh, Johnson felt that Schultz didn't really Write and uh, write about his architecture enough. Right, Invest right, even right, right. So I think that was yeah. So yes, I thought that was a very serious part of it. But I think honestly, even more. And that, then you. So the question is, did Johnson think he was a great architect or not? Is a, you know, all he did was go around saying, you know, I, I, he wasn't a great. He, part of his like uh, his personality was to claim that he wasn't great, right? That he was just a copyist. Uh, which was itself, I think, uh, a, a, a you know, a coy play. Oh, I think very much so. I mean, it was but it was to it was to it, um, to bring out the response. Oh no, no, Philip, you are a great architect. I mean, yeah, it, 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 yeah, but but, but on the other hand, I think he knew he wasn't right. Meese, but and then who the hell is right? I mean, it's like, but so on the. Talk loudly, and they will oh. figure out. They just go off. Maybe we can do that. All right. Okay. Good. Good. The does that does that work? Uh, That's the ghost of Philip. <laughs> right. Exactly. He he heard exactly what you were saying. Okay. He's not happy about it's Schultz. Funny, funny that it should happen at exactly this moment <laughs> in the conversation too. He really didn't like Schultz. No, I think. Uh, yeah. So, I think what he really at the end of the day was he did not see himself mm -hmm. in Schultz's book. I like Franz, he's a nice guy. I actually commissioned a book from him when, you uh, were at when I was at Princeton, Princeton Architectural Press. Press. Yeah. Press. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But he is a dry, he is an architectural historian's architectural historian, mm -hmm. he's German, mm -hmm. very dry. And I just don't think Philip Johnson saw Philip Johnson in his book about Philip Johnson. Right, 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 if right. You all have probably heard Philip on, seen him on TV, maybe you saw him in person, but he was unbelievably charming and like just antic personality and full of wit and humor and, and you know, just so engaging. And Schultz is talking about his relationship with Isaiah Berlin and what they had in common with, you know, th this deep, philosophical discussions and he's just never really you never see on the page Johnson like the wit and I think that right. he, not seeing himself there as a person made it even worse that he didn't see himself as an architect there you know in a way I might say that I mean there's a side of Johnson that appears superficial and trivial but was in fact quite brilliant and calculating and spoke very much to some of the issues that um, got you interested in terms of Caro and power and all that, uh, that you have taken more seriously than he did in a way, I think. Um, I think Schultz, Schultz tended to trivialize those parts of Johnson that appeared superficial, but in fact connected to a much deeper and more complex desire to exercise power, we might say, 
which I think you understood and he chose to mistakenly view as merely superficial and trivial and therefore minimized. That's why you're so good. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, can't, I, can't, I can't top that. Well, yes. Okay. That's a terrible yeah. response to that no, question. I, but I completely I, agree. Wow, that's really good analysis. <laughs> What, now, now, now you've left me speechless. Okay. Uh, yeah, no, we could, uh, we could, okay. yeah. You know, this. I don't think there, there's a lot you don't see in, in that. I think Johnson, he was such a multi, right, right, multivalent personality, um, and I, I think it also changed over, you know, the, it, the over the last twenty years. Right. Um, there's a lot that's in this book that wasn't in Schultz's book, I don't, you know. Well, actually, you mentioned Bill Bow a moment ago. Um, Schultz's book predates Bill Bow. Johnson played an enormous role in making Bill Bow and the building of the end of the 20th century in his celebrated you know, visit there and cr crying on camera, right. saying it was the greatest thing since sharks or some such thing. I forget precisely his words, but... They were, you know, something that was just beyond effervescence, and that helped establish that building and Gary in this whole new at this whole new level. I think. Well, not only did he help. I mean, I think that's part of the tremendous change in architecture that we see in '90s, where Bill Bow is, is sort of the the sort of the linchpin of this movement towards signature buildings in that are going to attract the public to right, faraway right, locations right. and all of a sudden every cultural institution around the world is trying to build their own uh, Bilbao. We call it the Bilbao effect, right? Mm -hmm. But it's more than just that. It's that this sort of Johnson has promoted this sort of international jet set group of architects. He calls them his kids. It's Rem Koolhaas and Zaha and Foster and you know we, we know all the, we know them, of course, Gary above above all. Um, and it's sort of, they're the Starkitects, and Johnson sort of creates this Starkitect class in many ways. Right. He is the ringleader of it. And well, and the godfather, you might godfa say. The godfather right, of right, it. Right, right, yeah. um, and this all happens sort of post Schultz, and I think it's probably the most important thing that happens uh, in it, was architecture. it was beginning to happen before that. I mean, there was the, for example, in, um, I think it was 78, 79, when he won the AIA gold medal and brought all of um, those architects down there to Texas, at the, right. like Dallas, I think. Uh, it was Houston. Or Houston. It was Houston, where he was awarded the gold medal. And there's a picture of him sitting on the stage holding the medal and all these young architects around him like acolytes. Yeah, well, it begin, you could say it even begins yeah. earlier than that, even in the 60s. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. When, I mean, I think this is another thing. That Schultz didn't want to talk about this moment where Johnson almost decides to give up architecture and to become, uh, to become sort of an, urban, an advocate for urban planning and, and a sort of a, pr a leader of the progressive urbanist circles, thought about even giving up his practice. I, one of the things that's so interesting to me about Johnson is that he has all these different careers, like right. He does, you know. There, there we see him actually picketing to save Penn State. Right, exactly. At, this at a time exactly when this the preservation moment. movement was barely in its infancy. Right, um, and Johnson as preservationist is a great story because he is at the both at the forefront of it, and and this is his plan to raise all of Harlem and build his own walled city in Harlem. So Johnson the preservationist is a great story. It's both he's both at the forefront of saving. Uh, you know, of, of really moving the preservation movement forward, uh, but you know, whenever it comes to his own mm -hmm. uh, kind of uh, projects, he's happy to knock down whatever's in the way. Um, it's not unusual among architects, but uh, it's interesting. But to me, like we think of Johnson as like the architect of skyscrapers. That's how we know him. But that was just a very late period. That's the late period Johnson. You know, he starts out uh, as really a curator, then he becomes a fascist political operative, uh, then he becomes, he goes to architecture school, and for most of his, uh, he's just an uh, architect to uh, basically of residential, uh, upscale residential work, like his here in New Canaan, um, and then it, 
institutional work, but he has no commercial clients at all. Like basically no commercial clients. The only commercial he, clients he has are those who are, uh, you know, his residential clients, his businesses, like Schlumberger, he does an office for them here. Right, right. But um, really not until he, he, he sort of has John Berge come along uh, to join his firm, and Berge, the sort of man in a, you know, the one-dimensional man or, you know, sort of man in a blue flannel suit is a businessman. That's only then does he start to build skyscrapers. I don't know where this was going, but uh, there was a uh, there was a reason I started talking about this a while ago, um, about the sort of different Johnsons, um, the, the many different Johnsons, the many yeah, different yeah, Johnsons. Yeah, yeah. And, and, um, um, but I mean, but it's, it's more than chronological. I mean, there were chrono there were chronological layers, but of course, almost everybody has phases in their life that way. I think what's more interesting about Johnson is the overlay at any one time where he was playing so many different games at once and he was you know, m manipulating the architectural culture even while he was also doing big business sky corporate skyscrapers right. and so forth. Yes. Well, yes. And he, well, to me, you can trace this all the way back to his, like his personality mm -hmm. is, he is always multiple, the idea that multiple ideas, multiple directions can be invested within him is part of his native personality. Right. Um, it's a, Johnson, uh, when he is a young man um, at Harvard, he, he's diagnosed with what is essentially bipolar disorder, manic depression, different name for it back then. But basically, he has these incredible, um, you know, periods of energy, right, that are characteristic of, of manics. Right, where he thinks he's on top of the world, he's above the mob, he's smarter, he's uh, full of energy, does in incredible productivity, and then these are followed by these incredible troughs of depression where he thinks he's incompetent and he can't do anything, uh, and he's incredibly depressed. Um, so there, he's always these two Johnsons, and then he's also living these two different lives, right, because uh, he just figures out that he's a gay man, and uh, but that's completely unacceptable uh, in the 1920s uh, uh, and, and beyond. Uh, so he has to live this closeted life. So in public, he's, he's um, heterosexual. In private, uh, he's gay. So he's always living these sort of multiple lives at the he's same time. Certainly not the only person dealing with that problem in, the, in those days, of course. Definitely not. Yeah. But, but, but when you... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Everybody yeah, yeah. has to. Everybody yeah, figure. Right. Everybody figures out a way of sort of like internalizing these issues mm -hmm. in their own way, um, and with him it was you know coming in multiple directions, and I think that was just. And also he was just incredibly smart and curious, right. um, a just unbelievably smart person. So he's always looking in, and he's interested in the next new thing. So to me that's another aspect of it. He's always. Why, you know, he's accused of having no uh, moral base because mm -hmm. he's always changing uh, his uh, style or his uh, intellectual uh, thought process. But it's, and you know, at what point is that curiosity, and at what point is it, um, you know, style for the job, lack of lack of spine? It's, it's sort of a a matter of perspective. Well, I, I think one of the things that I like about your book is that it's nuanced enough to not uh, rush to any simple judgment that it's one of those things or another, but it's a little of both, I think. And, and it, you, you, let, you let those two things coexist in a way because he, he certainly was one of the most genuinely curious people I've ever known and one of the very few whose curiosity did not diminish with age. If anything, it became more intense because he knew as he, as he got older, he was less, as anybody is when they get older, a little less automatically in touch with the new. And so he had to make even more overt efforts to connect with the new. Yeah, I mean, I think he was always refreshed by young people, which yeah. is really nice. Um, great, great. I mean, when I first met him, I was still a college student, and I was amazed at how seriously he seemed to be taking what I and the group I was with had to say. 
naively not knowing that he was not being generous and polite and caring. He was actually being incredibly selfish because he was like a sponge drinking in everything, soaking in everything we had to say. Um, but it was pretty thrilling if you were, you know, 20 years old or whatever. There you go. <laughs> right, uh, right. Exactly. But let me ask you this. Um, I mean, I, would you describe him in the end, or did you come to conclude in the end that he was more cynical or more earnest and idealistic? Because there were certainly elements of, one of the things that fascinates me about him is that I don't know that I've ever known anyone in whom cynicism and idealism were like wound together like braids almost. <laughs> and, and, and there was so much of both in, those, in him. Yeah, I just think it's inextricable. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I just think it's inextricable. Every, you know, is designing a synagogue for free right. uh, an act of, you know, cynicism or uh, an opportunism or is right. it an act of generosity? Right. You know? Right, right, right. And at some level, it's both. You know, maybe it just right. has to be appreciated as both. I agree. I mean, I think that's exactly right. I yeah. think. Yeah. I think a lot of what I've thought about is like, people just have to come to their own terms with Johnson, and I felt like I did, I guess, and I hope yeah. the book helps people able be able to do that. I mean, I like I wrote. You know, we haven't talked about the anti-Semitism well, yet, we, but we, we, we'll get you, there. You, you've given us by mentioning the synagogue a good way into it. Right, but I mean, my, what I was going to say was that, you know, right, Shimon Perez right. becomes one of his close friends, and, you know, he is the guy who, Perez negotiated Israel's peace with Germany, essentially, right, the, the, right. its relationship with Germany, so uh, if he can make peace with Johnson, then, I don't know, can you forgive him? I don't know. It's a, it's a t everybody has to make their own decisions. Right, right. Well, you have, I mean, uh, others have talked about his uh, horrific sympathies for anti-Semitism and indeed for even Nazism um, in the 30s. You have gone into more detail and given that even more weight than, than other writers have up to now. Um, but I think the other question is, you know, how, how far beyond it did he go? Did he truly, uh, was it a matter of opportunism to uh, become friendly with Shimon Peres? With many, many of the architects he supported, Frank Gehry among them, in fact, were Jewish. Um, Bob Stern, who was a great protege of, of Jewish ancestry, Peter Eisenman, and so forth. Uh, what does it all mean? Well, I went into it further because no one had reported this further, and I thought it was right. important to get it on the record that what he did was worse right. than what anybody knew. Right. Um, right. And I think he was more inextricably uh, attached to the Nazi state than anyone had reported before. And I did this through access to um, you know, files from the FBI and the Justice Department that had not been released before. Um, had they actually literally not been released, or did others simply not choose to? They had never. No one. No one doing uh, right. writing about Johnson had ever written about them mm -hmm. uh, at all, really. Um, so, his relationships with figures in the Gestapo, right. the uh, German, you know, the Abwehr, Secret Service, mm -hmm. uh, etc., and they were very tight. And I think it's really important at the moment to talk about this uh, because at the Right now, it's very timely, right? I mean, the reason, what's in, you know, so Johnson it becomes completely um, invested in fascist causes. And what he's trying to do is really mainstream fascism in America. And if you think back to that time, you know, there's a, there's a Nazi party in the United States, but for the actual German Nazi state, that's sort of a toxic group. Because for your average American, the American, you know, the Nazi Bund is like, they're clowns, and any red-blooded patriotic American will will is appall is you know insulted by them and their anti-Americanness, in in their being pro-German. So the German idea, state's idea is like, uh, uh, 
better to have sort of a group of intellectual uh, fascists who can uh, promote the ideas of fascism in America. Because what they really want is America to just stay out of European affairs so that they can go and continue their conquest of Europe and, and, and elsewhere uh, without American intervention. Uh, and the best way to do that is by convincing Americans that fascism isn't really that bad, and in fact, it's inevitable. Um, and in that, Johnson becomes a useful propagandistic tool. Um, and I just think now that's what's happening in America. That's there are some very interesting lessons uh, now that America first um, is a slogan that is once again in the language. Uh, yeah. Exactly, yeah. Uh, in many of the same ways. Um, and in fact, the America First movement um, before World War II was also uh, deeply intertwined with anti-Semitism, right? Yes, and also deeply intertwined with the Republican Party. Right. Um, so uh, to me, these are important to write about um, and to make clear. Um, so that's why I felt like it was necessary to sort of really look at, at who he was and then uh, examine that. And, you know, then you get to the, his relationships with these, you know, was he contrite after? Yeah, I mean, he did. I think there's, I don't know that he ever completely got over his prejudices because, um, and they were ingrained within him since he was, you know, a little boy. Um, and even if he tried, I'm not sure how much he could have gotten past them. Um, uh, but, you know, when confronted, I think so he could stink, you know, it's easy to think like, you know, one to one group is, uh, to think of a group in the abstract and then when presented with an individual, mm -hmm. not, not, you know, it's the, I have one black friend means I'm not a racist, right? Thing. Right, 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 um, right. And, mm -hmm. But he was great friends to many Jews and supported Jewish architects and Jewish causes, the Israeli state. Uh, Khan was, you know, he, uh, you know, thought Khan was the greatest architect of that of his generation for sure. Right. Um, and he thought Gary was the greatest architect uh, of, of his generation. generation. Right, right. And right. their relationship was really, really close. Yes. Um, you know, there was the 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 group of he called the kids, the mm -hmm. Zahas, the Eisenmans. Um, the Bob Stearns, but all of those, the one he really liked the most, not just respected as an architect, but the person, the, the, the person he really cared about and who cared about him was Gary, I thought. Um, Absolutely. No, they were uh, enormously close, and Gary revered him, actually. Um, and it's particularly interesting because uh, Gary had... Um, dislike bordering on contempt for most of the architecture that Johnson was producing during the years of their friendship. Um, and yet enormous respect for his intellect and, and fondness for him as a person. Yeah. My favorite story from the book, and I'll tell, I'll tell one, is, is their first real meeting, which is that... Um, the Ron Davis house. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. Uh, Gary designs a house for the painter Ron Davis in Los Angeles. Um, and he, this is in the early 70s, when really no one knows about Frank Gehry on the East Coast. He's not a household yeah. name at all. I wrote about that house in the New York Times Magazine. People didn't know about it in the East Coast. But, right. <laughs> You're killing my story. No, no. No, no, no I'm Don't not. Don't bother I'm me not. with the facts. I'm not, I'm not killing your story. It's OK. I, know, I think I know the story, and I think the story is fine. I didn't okay. give away a punchline. So Gary's still trying. Let's say Gary is still trying to build a reputation um, uh, nationally, and is sort of a, a still a, a, not a major figure in, in the profession. Uh, and he gets word that that Johnson is going to come out to Los Angeles, or is out in Los Angeles, and wants to visit him at the Davis House because he's heard about it and he thinks it's great and wants to see it. Um, so Gary talks to Davis, who's his friend, and they agree that they're gonna. Uh, meet Johnson at the, at the house, 
And so Gary's like terrified of Johnson coming and you know telling him what he thinks of the house. And Ron Davis is also you know freaked out because Davis a painter and Johnson's a famous uh, art collector you know connected to MoMA. So he's also uh, freaked out. So what are two like Los Angeles hipsters do in 1972 uh, when they're all nervous is they start smoking some weed. Um, and then they start smoking a little more weed uh, and a little more weed until they're completely stoned out of their minds. Uh, and Johnson comes and leaves and neither of them can remember him coming at all. Well, uh, y yes. All true. I think it's actually an even more funny and complicated story because apparently um, Ron Davis did notice that um, Philip did not notice any of his paintings and only <laughs> asked questions about the house. <laughs> and, and so he was sort of apparently, no, he, was, he was, let's say, alert enough to be really pissed about the fact that, that he only asked questions about the architecture and appeared not to notice any of the paintings, is how the story reached me. That's it. Well, see, I only got the Gary version. <laughs> he wasn't but but um, it's still a, it tells you a lot about their relationship that, you know. Well, it's also another uh, sort of corollary to that story is uh, that it all came about because the way uh, Gary and Johnson originally met was through David Whitney. Because um, Frank Gary was really, though he went to architecture school and was always an artist and not a painter, he, in the 60s, at the beginning of his career, was very close to the group of young artists in LA of his, who were his contemporaries. In fact, really more traveled in that circle than among fellow architects. And through that circle, uh, which was people like Ed Ruscha and Larry Bell and Ken Price and so forth, came to know um, Jasper Johns and Robert Rauschenberg and Roy Lichtenstein. And through them, they met uh, one of their good friends, or Gary met one of their good friends, the young curator David Whitney. And Frank, as Mark said, was sort of eager to advance his architectural career and met David two or three times and either asked David or Jasper Johns, I don't remember which one, that um, you know, when would he get to actually meet Philip Johnson? Because by then, David Whitney and Philip Johnson were already a couple. And apparently, one of them said to him, don't worry, you'll meet him when you're ready. <laughs> and, and apparently, the Davis house was when it was decided that Frank Gehry was ready and they would bring Philip Johnson to see his work. So there we are. Ladies and gentlemen, Paul Goldberg. No, 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 sorry, I didn't. <laughs> now, now back to Johnson and you. That's still a Philip Johnson story, Mark. No, no a, and look, it's, we've it's, got, you're the, yeah. the, you're well, the we, this is where our biographies like. So this is one moment where they intersect, actually. That's yeah. true. That's true. I think we actually both tell that story, although I think you, they're more stoned in your book than in my book. So. I think, I mean, I, 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 just, I just printed whatever G Gary told me. Maybe Good. he was stoned when he told you the story, as opposed to when he told me the story. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, they, they, they were stoned in my version, too, but not as much so, I think. Um, now, from there, there's... This is going to be great. <laughs> You're going to go home and tell people, like, yeah, we... Oh, never mind. They argued about whose version, whose who's, version... Who's, who smoked more, who's, whose version had them smoking more weed? That's yeah. true. You thought you were going to get a very profound discussion about the future of architecture. Yes, and instead. Um, well, if, or that can only segue uh, into Donald Trump then, I guess. Um, <laughs> That'll make us all want to smoke some weed. Right, exactly. Uh, so, I mean, it was a very sad end to his career in some ways, the, the work with Trump, because none of it was very good. Uh, it was after he and Bergui had broken up their partnership and gone their separate ways, and Johnson was kind of desperate to stay in the game and keep active and so forth. Um, and it seems to me as if the years since then have only made it seem even more tragic and horrible and embarrassing. What, what, what's your take on all that? 
I feel like they both needed each other. Yeah, you know, it was yeah, a moment yeah, when they both yeah. needed each other. You know, um, Donald Trump at that moment was still the child of, you know, this outer borough mm -hmm. uh, developer of middle and low income uh, housing for the most part, trying to make his, his name. Father was that. Right. He well, was, I said he, he was, was the, chi right, the child, child of. of. Right. Right. Exactly. Right, trying yeah, to yeah, yeah. eclipse the eclipse that his father in the big, you know, in the right. bright lights in of the big city, uh, of the in the 1980s. Um, and what better way to do it than by association with the epitome of blue chip establishment architecture right. uh, associated with MoMA, but also someone who. Uh, you know, was adept at hitting the front, you know, hitting the tabloid pages. This was perfect. And for Johnson, you know, uh, wanting to stay relevant, what better uh, client uh, than uh, Donald Trump, uh, who, you know, he needed work and wanted work, and here was uh, someone willing to give it to him and also, you know, make sure he stayed on the front page right. of the paper, which is, of course, where he always liked to be. So in that way, it was a match made in heaven, right up until the point where they actually had to work together. Uh, <laughs> and you know, uh, you know, Trump thinks Johnson is a prima donna, and Johnson thinks Trump is a vulgarian. And, and they were both right. They were both completely right. <laughs> um, um, and uh, in some ways, it, it's hilarious because um, some of the projects that didn't happen were hilarious. My favorite project that they didn't do was that were gonna be um, on 60th and Madison was gonna be uh, Trump, I forget the name. Trump of Castle. Trump Castle. And it was like yeah. Disney style condo tower, 60 stories tall with like, you know, crenellated battlements up top and a moat with live alligators <laughs> uh, on Madison Avenue and 60th Street. So that would have gone great. Uh, you know, he watered that project down and it became that office building next to the Federal Reserve right, Bank. Right, exactly, downtown. yes. Yeah. Where it, it actually- Really cheap, simplified- Yes, exactly. exactly. And also, that. where it kind of makes sense because the Federal Reserve right. has the battlements. So like, right, right. it almost makes sense there. Right, um, right. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, but they went on, and that was for a different developer. Uh, that was for Park. George Klein, yeah. yeah. Klein. yeah right. um, anyway, uh, but they went on to build uh, well, the Trump Hotel and on Columbus Circle to reclad the Gulf and Western Building right, right, right. that uh, uh, your not the, your antecessor, whatever that your Herbert, Herbert Herbie Herbert. called a, gola, a solid gold ingot standing on end, which I think he meant in a complimentary way, but that was Herbie, um, and uh, yeah, and then you know really awful that series that phalanx of towers. Uh, in what was originally going to be called Television City, but it's now just, I mean, they're even taking Trump's name off right, it Right, right, that's, that's the place that is now most famous for taking Trump's name off. Exactly, yeah. it was sort of this sort of series of just completely uh, un, unappealing, or just un anything Upper West Side towers. It's never really been, a, been able to sort of become a part of the city. Uh, un even though, ironically, it was created in part like to do like what Battery Park City did, which is extend the form of the city. Exactly. Right. Not do, right. No, it's sort of it, it, right. it was sort of stuck there behind Lincoln Center, yep. and just never really in, ingrained itself into the city. It was always sort of a, a place unto itself, a sort of dystopian. Right. Right. Trump. Right. Trumpscape. Right. Exactly. Um, you know the the this craving for the spotlight. Um, which he shared, of course, with Trump, is so um, almost incompatible with the really serious intellect, which, of course, is not not similar to Trump, um, that he had. Um, you know, I mean, uh, somebody who would, who Frank Gehry would say he would rather discuss architectural ideas with than anybody else in the world, practically, was Philip, um, and. You know, th those two sides are just very, very hard to kind of uh, make come together, aren't they? They're really hard. Yeah. Um, 
one of the things I like most about I, I really love his writing. Mm -hmm. um, he was an unbelievably gifted writer. Um, just so his like uh, his wit sings on the page. Right. Um, one of my favorite reviews. Uh, one of my favorite pieces when he he reviewed uh, one of his own books um, <laughs> for architect. I think it was for uh, our forum or so. Or I forget right, right, which, right. but. Uh, you know, he talks about like what a what a it's all tongue in cheek about what a and tremendous contribution his own book is to the to the field. Um, when it's it's just so witty and brilliant, but but there are also unbelievably trenchant pieces. Uh, some that still stand the test of time. Uh, is uh, seven crutches of uh, modern architecture, right, right, right. a classic. And I think one of my favorite things that he wrote was. Um, uh, an essay on on uh, Frank Lloyd Wright and his relationship with Frank Lloyd Wright was always this incredibly combative uh, relationship. And one of the most beautiful things he ever he wrote was this uh, an essay about visiting Frank Lloyd Wright uh, at his uh, uh, winter home in, in at Taliesin West, and about the experience of arriving at Taliesin West and you know, walking through, it sort of walks you through Taliesin West, uh, through, you know, through the entry, through the building, until you finally arrive at the master himself. Uh, you know, and it's like the prince meets the king. Um, and it's just, it, the essay is called The Frontiersman, which is, encapsulates everything that drove uh, right crazy about Johnson, right? Because, uh, you know, Wright liked to think of himself as a contemporary architect and the most modern uh, architect in the world. And what pissed him off was that Johnson was always trying to locate him in the past as this figure right. of history. So the idea that he was some frontiersman from the past, uh, you know, on the edge of the, the country, uh, you know, infuriated him when he was, you know, considered himself the most, you know, he's building the Guggenheim and, and here he's being called the frontiersman. Um, so sort of, it's sort of their relationship was constantly um, this sort of a hammer and nail thing. But you're right. In a way, I mean, he was, I think part of the paradox of Johnson is also he was more comfortable with words almost than with drawing. I mean, he was, he did not in fact draw very well, right? But he wrote brilliantly. He did. He was never a great, I mean, he worried that he, he was a, he was not as bad a draftsman as he is made out to be. Um, I think this is one of the things that, you know, there are architects who are artists who are extraordinary um, draftsmen, but there are plenty of great architects who are also crappy draftsmen, don't draw particularly well. It's, it's not really the key, it's about the idea. Johnson was an, you know, did okay as a draftsman. I saw his notebooks from the GSD when he was in graduate school. He did fine. He wasn't great, uh, but he was, you know, perfectly good. He got good marks. He got the award from the AIA as best student in his class, and it was a class that had like a whole bunch of real famous architects in it. So it wasn't. And he got to build his thesis. He built his thesis. Now it's all right angles, but um, uh, but he wasn't, you know. He wasn't a gifted draftsman. He wasn't an artist, but he could express his basic ideas on the page. And uh, but he, I, I think certainly he's more. I mean, he complained that he couldn't write either; that it took him forever to write and blah blah blah. But that wasn't right. even true either. Yeah, he wrote beautifully. He wrote right. beautifully, and he, he actually wrote. Yeah. He wrote fairly quickly. It, it drove him nuts that Arthur Drexler, his deputy, took forever to do anything, uh, um, uh, to write, and it all delayed. Um, but no, he was a gifted, gifted, right? He, was, he had gifts all over the place. Right. I mean, too many, probably. And he wanted to pursue them all. And I think that was part of the problem. Right. No, that's a, that's a very good way to put it. What do you think his legacy will be? There are a couple. I mean, I guess we're still, we're still writing it. Mm -hmm. um, but there are the buildings, right? right? Um, so there are buildings in basically every city in America, and there's uh, the glass house here. Right. Um, there 
is uh, the way he presented, I think he has a, a whole separate legacy in the field of design, in the field of curation, uh, the way we, pr we present design and architecture in museum settings is entirely a product of, or very much a product of Johnson's early work at the Museum of Modern Art. Um, and there's, you know, his way of thinking about architecture, um, which I think in many ways we've repudiated. Um, you know, Johnson thought of architecture as uh, an art, a capital A architecture. He wanted to be inspired when he walked into a building. He wasn't interested in social housing and social issues. He was he had no interest in green buildings. He had no interest in sustainability or ecological issues. That those things, uh, when he did become interested in them, it was by accident. Uh, he was interested in preservation, but often uh, he was, uh, you know, he was interested liable in to. But he was certainly not terribly interested in what we might today call neighborhood preservation. He was interested no. in, in fact, the preservation of great works of artistic architecture. That's really. true, and well, also some of the other as well, but he, you know, rued what the car had done to the American city. Right. Um, but then, you know, look, he built, look where he was building. You know, he was building re residential works in, in the suburbs. So I think it's a mixed, it's a very mixed legacy. Right. Um, but, and then there are the, the, there are the works that of, from those he promoted. Mm -hmm. and this incredible legacy at the museum. Right. Not only the individual shows, but the growth of that department and the institution as a whole. Sure. Um, so it's a tremendous legacy. I don't know that there were, you know, you talk about the most influential figures in the field. And then there's the art collecting. We haven't even touched right, on the art right, collecting. Right, right. Um, but I think he's one of the most important art sure. collectors of the 20th century, really. If you look at the signature works of art at MoMA, mm -hmm. You're talking about, you know, Johnson's flag, uh, Lichtenstein's right. girl with the, the ball. ball. Right, right. You're talking about, you know, Andy Warhol's gold Marilyn Monroe. You're talking, you know, there are a series. Gold came out of his collection. Yeah, yeah. yeah there, you know, if you calculated the, you can't, you could not calculate the actual value of that. And right. its identity, you know, then look back further, you've got the Schlemmers, yeah, you know, Bauhaus Stairway, you've got Otto Dix's Dr. Herman Meyer H, uh, um, his Mondrian, uh, which was great, uh, the, but the Sacred Islands of Clay. You know, there, um, the Rothko, there are so much a part of MoMA, right. which is so much a part of how we think about art. Like, th it's impossible to think of MoMA without his, these things that he collected. Um, and, and what, degree was it, you know, he um, pushed by Alfred Barr mm -hmm. or David Whitney, but in the end of the day, you know, they were his. Sure, sure, sure. And, and one of the broadest collections of Frank Stella and Warhol. Absolutely, uh, yeah. The deepest and, and fullest, yeah. yeah. Terrific. Great, thank you. We have time for a few questions, so uh, let's see if we can Take a few of those. Bring a microphone. Okay, uh, wait for Cole to bring you a microphone. Yes, right there. Thank you. Um, Hi, I I find it uh, it's hard to find humor in the fascist period, his flirtation with fascism, but I thought you did do some of that uh, when he's in the Midwest and he's going around, especially in Ohio, and he's presenting himself as a dairy farmer uh, and a man of the people. It, I just wondered how somebody so brilliant could be so stupid. Fair question. Um, that is a good, uh, how can someone so brilliant, uh, a lot of people seem really bright some days and completely stupid the other, in, on, on another day. Um, but I think the, the question is like, um, I just tried to find humor. I mean, I don't know if there's humor in this stuff. I just, the irony of Johnson, um, I, I just tried to find the irony in, in some of his like, worst behavior, because um, some of it is truly, in retrospect, hilarious. Um, I, I love the idea. Like, So um, Johnson, in 1934, um, quits MoMA to announce that he's going to start this uh, nationalist, populist, alt-right political party. Um, and he has 
a you know journalist come into his office at MoMA, right? And this is just after he's um, had this incredibly successful exhibition at MoMA called Machine Art, right? Where they've presented uh, this incredibly influential show, probably I would say the most influential design exhibition in American history. They've taken works of, of everyday life and put them, uh, objects of the everyday, and presented them as if they are works of art in a museum setting and in a beautifully designed setting, designed by Johnson mostly. Um, and there is everything from a waffle maker to a dentist chair, a spring, an airplane propeller, beakers, all this stuff. And it's all like, you know, it's all explained using like classical principles and his long quotes from Plato, et, et cetera. So right after this, he, he, he decides to throw away this career, which he's like incredibly successful at, to start this political campaign. He has, a, he has the, um, this, uh, you know, reporters into his office and he's telling them that like, what we need now is men of action, not intellectuals. Um, and he starts berating intellectuals and saying that what we really need now is, you know, we don't need these crazy intellectual people. All we need is men of ideas who are gonna, uh, you know, inspire the people. And here is this guy who is like, you know, it took him 12 years to get through Harvard. He now works at a Rockefeller funded museum. And he's just had this exhibition where he, you know, uh, you know, put a, showed the world a waffle iron uh, and then, you know, justified it by quoting Plato. And now he's telling you that <laughs> what we don't need is intellectuals. I mean, it's completely, <laughs> then they, you know, he drives off to, to go, you know, uh, support uh, Huey Long's share of the wealth campaign. And they drive down in his Packard 12, which is like, you know, like the most expensive like a, car you right, could possibly right, have, exactly. right? It's like completely ludicrous. It's like a, it's like a, it is a comic. I mean, it is amazing the, the degree of self-knowledge. I mean, how low it was actually at that point. I mean, how little he saw of himself at that point. I think that, that, that may have changed more than any other thing about him. It was, a, or maybe not, a degree of self, how much he saw himself, how well he saw himself as the years went on. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I think it was always like, you know, yeah, yeah. definitely he learned. Right, right. I think he learned that, that he was going to have, he was never, I, he envisioned himself as the fascist leader. Oh God. And I think quickly he learned that he was going to have to be the Svengali. So that would have to be Donald Trump instead. He would have to be a Svengali, the man behind the leader. Yeah, right, right. Let's take up more. Yes, in the, yes sir. Yeah. Yes, I, I have a uh, question and then a follow-up. Uh, what, what is weed? <laughs> and then uh, the follow-up is the way that you've described Philip Johnson and have educated me sitting way in back here is you've somewhat described the man he ultimately allied with for need, and that is Donald Trump. You've s described a person who seeks the limelight but at the same time has some abiding kinds of precepts that he goes by. Could you comment on that? <laughs> you kind of lost me a little bit yeah, there. I'm not sure what the point um, is. So it's a but I, as, as noted, oh, uh, I, I think that the two were kind of made for each other in a way. They sort of needed each other, um, and then, but they, they could never coexist. Uh, yes, sir. Can you wait just a second? We can get the camera up. I mean, the the, the microphone up up. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, that gentleman, and then and then in the front. Yeah. Uh, I had a a friend and colleague who was a classmate of his at the Graduate School of Design, and immediately after the war, all of his classmates were aware of his fascist. Uh, sympathies before the war, and he was boycotted oh. by them for a long period of time until he built a house, a, a contemporary house in Cambridge, right. and began to give very lavish parties, and he won his way back into the good graces good. of his, cl his uh, classmates. You know, related to that, I've always wondered, how did he get into the U.S. Army with all that stuff in his records? No, 
No, he was in the, he was in the army. I think your your time he that's I will I will dispute your timeline um, and your friend's timeline on on how he ingratiated himself mm -hmm. um, at Harvard. Um, how did he get in? Uh, well, because they were drafting they were drafting everyone, and um, when they realized his record, right. um, he went from perhaps doing something to essentially doing KP duty right. and worrying about being put on trial for sedition. Mm -hmm. And it was a really sad, awful time for him. But in fact, uh, even before then, he had tried to become, uh, uh, to join the, what was essentially the OSS. Mm -hmm. And he had interviewed um, with uh, Wild Bill Donovan, uh, who, who was sort of the, the leader of the OSS Later, the, which be, you know became the CIA after the war, um, and what's really funny, and if you look at his FBI file, um, there are like this series of like terrified messages flying around Washington uh, at that moment, being like, you know, after Donovan interviews him, there's like, you know, you can't have him. <laughs> no, no, no. Be warned. Be warned, because um, there was a long FBI file on him from you know. A seri the, his, his F there were FBI files on him, you know, from the early 30s. Many of them in, in many different cities. So he would. Um, but I mean, the question is actually an important question, which is, you know, how did he, how did he clear himself from, uh, from his trespasses after the war? And it, I mean, it's funny to say he built a house and entertained people, but that's not really true. And I think more broadly, the question is, you know, how, how could he have this history and get away with it? And I think you have to look, um, first of all, part of it was that he had friends, many of them were Jewish, who forgave him. Uh, and they loved him and cared about him and believed him. And when he did build synagogue, a synagogue, uh, they accepted his, uh, uh, you know, it as a work of contrition. Uh, and they were eager to have him back because they cared about him and he was so brilliant and bright. Um, but also, um, this was, you know, the moment after the war. Uh, America wasn't interested in looking back at your, your record in the 30s. Uh, it was looking at the future. Uh, the world it, it was the most prosperous period, right? It's like it was booming forward. The cities were becoming the modern places that we know. Everything was just about the future at that moment and building for the future. And the truth was a lot of people didn't have records that would have made you proud in the 1930s. Uh, Henry Ford, not so good. Uh, Charles, Lindbergh. Charles Lindbergh, not so good. Frank Lloyd Wright, not so good. Lots of people didn't have positive. The Republican Party pretty much you know, all, was completely opposed to any American intervention. Um, there were a lot of people who didn't want to look back and were happy to look forward. And Johnson, you know, was able to take advantage of that. Um, uh, and I think was a part of that. So it's, I think it's too easy to say, well, just, well, he built a house and threw some nice parties so people forgave him. I think it's part of the broader culture. Good. Let's do a couple more very quickly. Um, yes, ma'am, right there. I've always wondered uh, about um, the fact that the Nazis were very anti-gay. And uh, I wondered if Philip Johnson was aware of that or and if he had accepted his own sexual orientation at that particular time. But it always seemed ironic to me that they were so and to anti-gay, and how he, how did he deal with that? There were also, I could add to that question, very anti-modern architecture, of course, too. So the two yeah, things that yes. seem to identify his character most, um, his identity as a gay man and his commitment to modernism, were both things that the Nazis were violently opposed to. Yes. Okay, well, first he thought he could, he, his hope was that he could turn the, Nazi state towards modern architecture. He very much hoped that it would realize the error of its ways and uh, and uh, look at Mies 
and accept Mies and his direction uh, of architecture and adopt it as the architecture of the Third Reich. Uh, as for being gay, first of all, there was a, in the early days of uh, the Nazi party um, coming out of the Weimar years, uh, there was a very strong um, homosexual element within the Nazi party. Uh, Ernst Röhm, uh, and, and that uh, most prominently, and that was not cut off until the night of the long knives uh, when Hitler had them all murdered. Um, so Johnson wasn't a part of that, but uh, just that there was something. Uh, so Johnson, I mean, I think there's a, throughout Johnson's life, and, and in this period in particular, there's a, there's a, a level of psychological, like, trying to pretend something that you're not. Uh, he writes, I, I think one of the most ridiculous things he ever writes is he writes this um, this uh, essay, this sort of Mutasian essay on how Americans are committing race suicide by not producing enough uh, white children. And, I mean, here's the gay man who's, like, complaining that Americans aren't reproducing enough. Uh, it, it was absurd. Um, so I think he, you know, denied, denied it. Um, oh, even though, I mean, I think he, there was some self, there was some self hatred there. There was, I mean, all, all these complicated feelings within him, uh, uh, trying to mask what he really was. Um, uh. Great. We've been asked to adjourn at 7.30, which we're past already. So I, I, I think we must call things up. Thank you all very much for being Thank you. here. And, um, Thank you, especially, thank you particularly to Mark, whose book, whose book is available in the back of the room. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Thank you thank for you coming all. out. Okay, good.